Welcome to another episode of Words of Wokeism. This time I'm not in my car. Um, this is a this is for a request. I got a request yesterday to explain holding space. Holding space. You've heard that, right? We're holding space for you. Let's hold space for them. What it what does this term mean? You hear it all the time. Um, I'm going to use a a visual aid to help me with this one. Of course. I'm going to give you my translation, what I think it means in practice, but let's take a look at what it officially means. Just so you know, it comes from therapy. It's therapeutic language. And that's important, of course, because you're probably wondering why do I hear it all the time in relation to my child's school? I mean, you're hearing it everywhere. It's a word of woke, but it goes along with the whole mental healthism thing where everybody fancies themselves a therapist now, including school teachers and principals and vice principals and social workers. Everybody, everybody is trying to be all therapeutic, unsolicited, of course. And like DEI, it is a lie. It's a lie. What you find is that the people who talk the most about holding space for others are very selective, very selective about the people who deserve to have space held for them. But let's take a look at their definition. And I say there because I checked five, six, seven places. It's all the same. I just picked psychology today because I think it's probably the most credible in terms of being a mainstream source that probably a lot of therapists refer to and no doubt a lot of school officials refer to. What does it mean to hold space? Learn the art of holding space. When you find out what this is, you're going to once again wonder, why do they have to keep making up new terms for just not being an asshole? <laughs> okay? Like, teach your kid the golden rule. Social emotional learning. <laughs> uh, what are life skills? Holding space. Deb's broad definition of what it's supposed to be is be a decent listener. Don't be a self-absorbed asshole. Okay. But let's go through it. Holding space is a practice of making space for somebody else's experience and centering them. <laughs> to hold space, one must be fully present and create a safe environment. Now, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to do this like a fisk because if you don't know what a fisk is, it's a particular style of going through things, stopping, critiquing it, going on, named after a, a journalist. All right. So Making space for somebody else's experience. Put other people ahead of yourself. That's what it means. Now, as I said, if you actually offer that to someone, if you're if you are inclined to do that, if you are voluntarily choosing to listen to someone, say, hey, tell me what's wrong. I want to hear, I want to help, then obviously it would be a good idea for you to actually shut up and listen and let them tell you what they feel or think or whatever based on their experience. It's the centering them part that I have a problem with, centering them. This is so subjective and it depends on the circumstance. If you've volunteered to engage, if you are choosing this interaction, so obviously in a therapeutic setting, that's your job, but this is used on our kids. We're going to hold space for this person, hold space for that person. What if you don't want to? You should be able to not do this. You should be able to decide you really aren't interested in centering someone else's experience because you have denied the time, the inclination, the emotional stamina, whatever. You're just a kid. You're just a person. You're not a therapist. You're not literally getting paid to center someone else. The fact that they have to explain this to therapists is kind of scary. Isn't this your job to center the patient? So that's what I find it hilarious that it's in psychology today that they're talking about the art of holding space. I uh, would have thought that would go without saying, maybe I'm crazy. But again, we're not talking about people who are actually therapists. We're talking about this term used in daily life amongst lay people, your friends, your family, your school teachers. Uh, so centering other people is by no means your obligation, and yet it is made out to be the, that. 
And there may be many, many, many reasons that you don't want to, nor should you center other people in your interactions. To hold space, one must be fully present. Please define that. What does that mean? Like so many woke things, the person who's using the term gets to decide. So the person who declares that we're going to hold space for someone or a group of someones or an identity class of someones gets to decide whether you are or are not being fully present. Not you. Not you. If you say, no, I'm really, I'm fully present. It doesn't seem like you are. Mm -hmm. Because if you were, reason, 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 this ends up starting to weaponize because that is completely subjective. One must be fully present. So you can imagine wielded by a teacher or a peer against your child, what this can be. They're not fully present. They're not really listening to me. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. Who gets to decide? Create a safe environment. Oh, please explain what that is to me. To the kid who's wielding all kinds of fancy pronouns, a safe environment is somebody who uses those pronouns on demand and then changes them on demand. That's what's safe for them. This safe environment for the person who doesn't want to use those crazy pronouns is to not be forced to use the crazy pronouns. So safe environment is an ever moving target. It's like uh, constantly shifting. Once the circumstances are created, holy space fosters listening and empathizing. Oh, there it is, empathizing. It would, in theory, again, if you're a therapist with a patient, you're going to be hard pressed to empathize with your patient if you can't at least listen to them. This, again, should be axiomatic in the practice of psychotherapy. But in terms of peer groups or social emotional learning lessons or just the math class, saying we're going to hold space for someone so that you can foster empathy is weaponizing the empathy again, because it's not voluntary. People don't get to decide if they want to hold space for whomever the school decides or your friend group or your book club or your whatever. They decide they're going to hold space. The person in charge, the person in power defines what the safe environment is, defines what fully present is going to look like, defines whether, you know, what empathy is going to sound like and be, is it going to be money out of your pocket? Is it going to be certain actions that you're taking? they get to decide. So the whole concept of holding space is really dependent on who's declaring that you're going to do that. It's rarely you saying, I want to do that. Because if you're not speaking woke, woke ease, you probably would simply say to your friend, I want to listen. Tell me what's going on. Uh, no judgment. Go. That's what it would look like. It wouldn't be like, I want to hold space for you. And if you notice 99% of the time, the term hold space in the woke vernacular is used by one person or a small group of people directed at a very large group of people. And it's a directive of how they're expected to behave. So before coming to a therapist, oh, notice we're talking about therapists. I had no idea what it meant to hold space for somebody. I'd never heard the term, but now the term proliferates social media and serves as the foundation of mine and most other therapists' work. Holding space is the backbone of supportive relationships and bridges the gap between people when one person is in distress. Or it allows one very narcissistic cluster B a-hole to dominate everybody else because that happens too. They will demand that you hold space. Or their temper tantrum, which of now, of course, is everybody else's imperative in the world of woke. My feels. I have more feels than you, therefore. And especially if you tick all the boxes on the intersectional chart, especially if you come from a allegedly colonized group of people, check, 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 check. Now you can demand that others hold space or more than likely going to find some woke person and teacher, like I said, counselor, social worker, who's going to demand that everybody hold space this individual or this kind of individual because we're now not really individuals. We're just a kind of individual, kind of like you have flavors of ice cream or breeds of dog. <laughs> That's what we are now. We're kinds of individual. Be fully present without distractions. Well, in the woke, a distraction could mean opinions that don't match theirs. That's very distracting. But I don't, I don't agree that pronouns are something I should be forced to Get those old ideas out of your head. Don't stop. 
Those are distractions from the work. Create safe, accepting environment. Set aside your boundaries. You don't have any, just, you know, the safe environment is defined by the person that you're supposedly listening to, not you, and whatever they want goes. Whatever their definition of safety is goes. And if you don't like that, well, that's a distraction you need to set aside in order to create the safe, accepting environment. Discernment and judgment are not allowed even when it violates your personal boundaries. Listening effectively. Now, used to be listening effectively was making eye contact, mirroring, you know, repeating what someone says just to check understanding. It didn't require you to actually accept what the other person was saying. In fact, I think this is a very bad therapy to just be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, definitely. Oh, very valid. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is not therapeutic. Taking it all in and really listening to it, yes, making sure you're hearing things accurately. Did So I hear you saying X, Y, Z, this would be listening effectively. The listener is present for the speaker's experience. Mm-hmm. How would you not be? What, I'm somewhere else? I'm not in the room? Uh, does not make the conversation about them. Well, that, again, ought to be axiomatic in therapy. We're not going to turn around, well, when I was a kid. I mean, that's rule number one of therapy. We don't project ourselves into the situation, which is something woke do all the time, all the time. As a, as a, as a, I want to say, I just want to say that as a, eh, we're holding space for you. But as a. Uh, does not shut down difficult conversations, doesn't shy, shy away from strong feelings. Again, why should your child not be allowed to do that? Why is your child obliged to have difficult conversations or, you know, be vulnerable and not, you know, shy away from strong emotions if they're not ready to deal with them? So again, holding space in a therapeutic environment with a trained professional who's being paid to do this makes some sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever for minor children in their school or for you on demand in your social life. Empathizing. There it is, the weapon. Finally, holding space includes empathy. I don't agree with this. I'm sorry. I don't agree. Even in a therapeutic environment, I don't agree. Not every therapist is going to empathize with your situation. They, they can't possibly. They're going to see patients who've been through experiences they've never been through. So you can try to empathize, but I don't think it's required. I've been a therapist. I, if they tell me they can't empathize because they haven't been through it, that's honest. I'd rather they said that than digging deep to try to find some way. Now you are putting yourself into my experience. That's what empathy is. This means not just hearing what the other person says, but also understanding their perspective and feelings. You can't. Okay, someone who's not been a mother can't understand what it is to be a mother. Sorry if that hurts your feelings. That is reality. I've been both. I had my children very, very late. And I used to bristle at that. You can't understand. I'd be like, I, I've babysat my nephews. I, I I know I work with kids. Horse hockey. Sorry, you know, you don't. You literally have no clue. It's it's it. it, it no, the answer is no. Uh, if you haven't been through all kinds of experiences, you can't know what it feels like. And we're hearing this all the time, aren't we? You don't know what it's like to be black. You don't know what it's like to be oppressed. You don't know what it's like to be trans. You can't possibly tell me how this feels and that feels and the other feels. So. Why is it okay for some people to say, you can't empathize with me because you can't, because you're not me, which actually makes sense, but use that as a weapon and then demand you to try anyway. You don't know what it's like. Well, I'm trying to be helpful anyway. I'm trying to listen. Yes, and you should. What? That doesn't make sense. I should be able to not empathize with you and you should be able to accept the fact that I can't empathize with you and state it as a fact, not as a weapon, not as an accusation, not as something to beat me over the head with that no matter how hard I try, I will not possibly satisfy your demands because I am not you. That's where we stray into cluster B territory, narcissistic territory. Empathetic listening can have a range of benefits, including improved relationship and lessened conflict. You're not trying to have a relationship with your therapist just so you know. You're really not. I mean, hopefully you have a good working relationship, but that's where it ends. Too much empathy, you have transference, you have projection, you have unpleasant, healthy, unhealthy things. At the heart of holding space is being with a person and their emotional experience without trying to fix them or their problems. Okay, can I fix the problems they're creating for me? Because that's one of the biggest problems I have with the whole holding space concept is that 90% of the time in the woke, the holding space concept is creating problems for me and other people, lots of people. You know, 
hold space for my feelings so you'll let me in the bathroom in the locker room even though I'm a biological man hold space for me and understand my experience so that I can berate you with how much I hate you and your your kind and make it okay because uh, you know don't call me a racist don't call me a bigot don't call me a misogynist don't call me an anti-semite don't call me all the things that I'm demonstrating to you that I am through every word because you're busy holding space and listening actively and trying to empathize with me and trying to, you know but don't try to fix it okay but you know these feelings that you want me to be present for and take in for are quite hostile and actually terrifying to me because I don't know when you're going to wake up someday and act on it. So, um, you know, I don't want to try to fix you. I just kind of want to stay away from you. I want other people to fix the situation so that I can have a safe environment, but that's not allowed because we're holding space. Um, you know, the solving is letting the other person know that you are there, you understand, and you aren't going anywhere. Again, this is completely inappropriate for a school environment. You may go somewhere away, far away from that person who you were just ordered to hold space from because now they've shared with you that they just pretty much hate your guts for a wide variety of reasons. And where this is often used, so you know, parents, is in restorative justice. They'll sit with, you know, one person has another conflict with another person, a group of people have a conflict with another group of people. And we're going to do restore, we're going to hold space for each other and everybody gets to share their ideas. This person was bullied. These are the bullies, but we're going to hold space for the bullies. Why would we do that? How does holding, how does forcing the victim to hold space for the victimizers improve anything? The message is. You guys are equal. There's no moral difference between someone who was victimized and someone who is the victimizer, even as they are lecturing us about oppressor and oppressed. The iron law of woke contradiction, the iron law of woke projection, it's all in there. So that's holding space in a nutshell. A potentially useful thing in therapy, provided you don't go too far and your therapist isn't trying to empathize with you because I'm sorry. Your mileage may vary. Other, you know, therapists who are actually, I'm not a therapist, therapists might come and say, well, Deb, no, it's important to empathize with their clients. That's your business. I personally do not want my therapist empathizing with me. I don't expect that. I think it would be weird. I actually look for the person, if I am going to therapy, to have a distance so that they can effectively help me. I don't go to therapy to not be fixed, helped, counseled challenged if they don't have any kind of thoughts about what I'm thinking that contradict what I'm saying or feeling or challenge what I'm feeling, how helpful are they going to be? There might be a phase of holding space, but I would expect that to quickly move on. Now, if you get too deep into empathy too quickly, are you really, now you're kind of going to be, whatever you're saying to me, you're either going to be over-personalizing it and now it becomes about you and your situation and mine are, there's no way they're the same. Or you aren't going to be able to help me because then it would be like picking on yourself. Stop. If you don't involve yourself in the therapy, then don't empathize. But to do this to children, to do this to a whole class of children, to do this as a form of discipline is uh, asinine, completely asinine. I would actually go so far as to say it is harmful, harmful. Telling people they need to hold space for other people is absolutely wrong. I don't, I don't see any upside to it. I think instead, if you, what you want to do with kids is say, we are going to teach you what listening skills are, which by the way, helps them academically. And when you guys get in a fight, um, you know, separately force people together, uh, we might try to talk again about how, did you, you know, ask them questions, ask questions. Did you ask questions? Do you know what's going on? Do you have any idea what's happening? What would you like to do? I would like them to be far away from me. Okay. I don't feel safe. Okay. Then the school's actually holding real space for the person who was, you know, bullied or victimized. Not let's get everyone together and hold space. No. I think this is something done one-on-one -on -one only with voluntary participation. And if the kid says, I don't want, I don't want to discuss it, whether you hold space for me or not, I don't want to talk about it. I just, where's what I want? I want you to keep that kid away from me. I've been through this. I had a bully child. And when asked, what would you like us to do? What would you, she said, keep her away from me. Well, we can't, we have to, you know, blah, blah. They didn't use the term hold space then, but you know, we have to understand her perspective, this and that and the other. And I said, why? No one's hurting her. 
No one's making her life a living hell every day. Well, we don't know what's going on. Don't you though? It's pretty simple. She's laying hands on my kid. She's hurting my kid on a daily basis. My kid is kicking and screaming, not wanting to get out of the car to come to school. So it seems pretty cut and dry to me. You've seen it. It's been documented. It's, I'm not making it up. She's not making it up. She says she wants to be moved to a different class. That's what she wants. But you know, what if we get you to get, there's no what if. So holding space in that situation is wildly inappropriate. It's another form of bullying. So anyway, I hope this helps. Thanks for listening. As always, please like, share, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy this sort of content. And I will be back, I don't know, soon probably with another word of wokeism. Have a good one.